Thank you very much. And um, I want to say good afternoon to fellow countrymen. Good afternoon to all the Zambians that are following this press address uh, by members of the uh, Patriot Front, members of Parliament. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of all the members of Parliament uh, present here. The Honorable Cassandra, Member of Parliament for Bangalore Constituency. The Honorable uh, Brian Mundivire, Member of Parliament from Parokoso Constituency. The Honorable Mutatwe Kafuaya, Member of Parliament for Lunte. The Honorable Karawin Kosa, Member of Parliament for Chinsari. Honorable Kampampi, uh, the Member of Parliament for Mansabombe Constituency. Uh, my name is Gordon Mira, Member of Parliament from Freedom Central constituency and uh, I will be moderating this session uh, this afternoon. Um, fellow countrymen and women, members of the press present here uh, and those connecting, as we all are aware that tomorrow, the 28th of uh, September, in this year 2024, the Minister of Finance uh, will be presenting Zambia's national budget for 2025. We all understand that this is the fourth budget that this government of the UPND will be presenting since they formed government in 2021. So far we are counting three budgets down. We have two more to go, uh, the full one being the one we will be listening to tomorrow for 2025. Expectations are very high, especially for the common Zambians because we know the challenges that we are going through as a country. The energy crisis that has led to the shutdown of many businesses across the country, that has led to the layoff of many workers across the country because companies can no longer raise resources to maintain their payrolls. Hence, a lot of people have lost employment. Uh, we have the water crisis across the country. This time it's not even in the rural areas where we know that piped water has been a challenge. Even in the urban, the most urban parts of this country, Usaka, the Copper Belt, there is shortage, critical shortage of water. Food prices have gone up. Critical food shortage that we are facing in this country. The high cost of living that even the workers are facing challenges that the civil servants are facing to make ends meet because their buying capacity with the current salaries that they are getting has been taken away by high inflation and high prices of goods and services. So these are the challenges that we are living day in day out. And uh, as a matter of introducing our topic, I expect that the budget will answer to these challenges. We are not interested in the jargon of GDP fiscal deficit, fiscal discipline, inflation, interest rate. That is the jargon that we've been fed to in the last three years of this government. If you emphasize on maintaining your GDP at a certain rate, would that bring water in the households? If you talk about maintaining inflation within a certain range, would that result in the reduction in the prices of goods and services? So we expect plain and simple budget that will address the challenges that the people are facing. That jargon of economies, that jargon of the IMF infiltrating in our budget, I think Zambians are not interested in it. The only language that we expect to see, to find in the budget speech and the budget itself, is that which will address the power crisis, the food crisis, rising cost of living, water crisis, lack of employment, even for the youth. That is what we expect. Support to all the sectors of this girl, of this country. Agriculture, mining, tourism. We expect answers how these sectors are going to be revamped because we are all aware that they have seriously been affected by so many challenges in this country. And so, um, to begin our discourse, I will be inviting Honorable Brian Mundubile to address us on the expectations that he has and the expectations that the people of Zambia have through him that we are going to hear. Honorable Mundubile, we are invited. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mamuila. 
I will rely on the protocol that has already been established <coughs> and proceed, uh, you know, to deliver my a short address. On the 13th of September, uh, 2024, President Haga in the Chilema uh, delivered uh, a State of the Nation address uh, uh, on the floor of the House. This is where we expected him to set the tone, the tone for the country going forward. Uh, at the time that he was coming to address the House, uh, members of Parliament, as representatives of the people, had raised various concerns uh, that included uh, load shedding, the highest, high cost of living, uh, distribution of farming inputs, among others. It was our expectation that um, when the President uh, came to address the nation, he was going to deal with these very, very important uh, matters. And we also know that uh, it's the President's address that sets the tone uh, for the budget. However, we were very, very disappointed with the address of His Excellency the President uh, delivered uh, uh, on the floor of the House as it did not or it veered off and avoided to address the many challenges the Zambian people are going through. As Honorable Mwila has uh, stated, Zambians are no longer interested in these figures. The billions of dollars of investment there a 1.2, this other mine is putting in. The simple question is, what is the real contribution? Or what does that particular investment do to a local, an average Zambian living in Kanyama? Does that improve you know, their, their welfare? Hey, countrymen and women, uh, if you remember, from 2021, after Comrade Musokotwane delivered his uh, 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 budget speech on the floor of the House, a number of concerns were raised because members of parliament are, uh, were able to raise concerns and the response we're getting from our friends on the right, the UPND was that wait for our budget. We are implementing a PF budget, wait for our budget. In 2022, when the minister delivered his uh, 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 address to parliament, we raised issues. They again said, wait for the IMF deal. Wait for the IMF deal. 2023, the same thing, they shifted and said, wait for debt restructuring. As representatives of the people, we can clearly see that uh, our friends in the UPND have never had a clear roadmap on how to develop this country. And that um, even as they come to Parliament, be, whether it's the President or the Minister of Finance, they just come with figures in the hope that they will excite citizens to believe that there's something going on. But the net effect on the ground is not felt. So if you look at the area of tourism, what policies in tourism has the EPND government come up with to transform the tourism sector? In the first year, they were talking about the Northern Circuit, the Cassaba Bay, money put in the Cassaba Bay, uh, money put in the Uwa and many, many others. We know that the contribution of the tourism sector uh, to GDP, if there is proper investment, can be quite colossal. But because nothing has happened, there has been no movement in that area. Let's look at the agricultural sector. Right from 2021, the Minister of Finance has been talking about investments in the farming because under the Patriotic Front Party, we had set up farming blocks in every province. Every province had a farming block. What was remaining was the investment in those farming blocks. So when our friends took over, we expected that they would begin to put in money so that uh, one, we create employment, and two, we are food secure. So these farming blocks were properly chosen. These were properly chosen areas. If you look at Northern Province, we actually did studies. We had a Chinese, uh, a Chinese company called China Railway that donated uh, a study uh, which was uh, uh, carried out at the cost of two million then. And uh, it was expected that uh, government would take advantage of that and invest in, in, in these farming boards. So if we're talking about transforming the agricultural sector, yes, we've got the FISI program that has been going on. 
We expected government to go higher by, you know, by putting investments in, in, the, in, in the, the farming blocks. It must be known that uh, infrastructure, as a matter of fact, is a major part of agriculture. So we expected that by now, three years later, government was going to put in money in the agricultural sector. So we therefore hope that government this time around will show some seriousness in whatever they are doing by you know, putting, or, uh, putting in their budget some money that will go uh, in the uh, farming blocks. Uh, yesterday, the Minister of Agriculture made a, a statement, some statement escaped you know, uh, from his mouth where he was talking about wanting to do away with FISIP, saying FISIP has been problematic. Yeah, but he forgot that the same FISIP which he says has been problematic, when it was properly implemented, was uh, giving this country a yield of up to three, over three million tons of maize every year. Now, FISIP under uh, Comrade Mutolo and President Akainde Ichilema, we are beginning to ex import maize or receiving donations even from countries that we ordinarily should be giving, you know, uh, the assistance to. So I want to appeal to the Minister of Finance that yes, through what Honorable Mutolo said yesterday, we know that you've got plans to do our with FISIP. Our farmers have been surviving uh, through FISIP. We've uh, attained food security through FISIP. So can you please cancel those plans to do our with FISIP? We've been receiving calls the whole morning, you know, from farmers asking us why the APND government wants to do away with FISIP. Uh, so we want to appeal to you, the stage where we are, the hunger situation in the country, you cannot afford it to be suicidal on your part, Comrade Mutolo, to do away with, with, with FISIP. Can you please make sure you sit down with the Minister of Finance as it comes tomorrow, uh, you know, he should have changed figures and reinstated the figures and if anything, scale up the FISIP so that we can begin to produce as uh, we were producing before. And of course, um, we expect to get some, uh, we're asking difficult questions. There's been so many figures in the mining sector. Uh, the president is always boasting about figures, one point so billion, that billion. But what's the net effect? First of all, there's been no impact on the foreign exchange of, of our country. Uh, secondly, we have to question, what is the real a net effect on our GDP? And so far, we've just been uh, uh, praise singers for the, the mining houses. Our governments have been turned into praise singers for mining houses. They are always sitting by and clapping for mining houses. When they see, you know, equipment coming in, they are clapping. You know, they are, we are fooled with figures that actually don't even come to, 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 to this country. Yeah, we can't sit back and watch our leaders being reduced to praise singers for uh, mine owners. The question that we want to ask Your Excellency the President, begin to evaluate the real benefit that we're getting out of the mining sector. My colleagues are going to speak to the various policies that we think need to be changed in the mining sector. But for now, we want to say to His Excellency the President, the only investment that you should speak to is an investment that will bring a real benefit to the Zambian people. If mining houses are investing uh, for their profits and they will later take these profits away, we are not interested. Please don't even talk about them because these are mere figures that you know, have no impact uh, on our people. And of course, uh, the manufacturing, manufacturing and retail uh, sector. This is one sector that has been neglected. We haven't seen government giving incentives to manufacturing and you know, the, the retail sector. This, these are the real uh, you know, uh, drivers of the economy because they employ people across the sectors. But we haven't seen any promotion. We have seen incentives in the mining sector where uh, mostly the, 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 the players are foreign. In the manufacturing sector, we've got very big companies, very good companies that are coming up, but we have not seen, you know, government are putting any effort in that. Yeah, so I think the last part I wanted to, to speak to is um, 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 the selective manner in which development is being done. Uh, like I said to you, 2021, wait for the budget. 2022, wait for IMF. 2023, wait for debt restructuring. I don't know what they're going to tell us now. But in the meantime, all we have seen in these constituencies, we have seen CDF and everybody is singing um, uh, CDF. So I remember, uh, you know, uh, Comrade Miller, uh, somebody talked about indoctrination. Uh, indoctrination is where your imagination is arrested. You know, the people who indoctrinate others 
uh, you know, play on their mind such that, uh, you know, they, they, they forget to even see what is obvious. If you see how our colleagues praise CDF and what CDF has done, you would wonder whether these uh, same colleagues and MPs also have seen the flyover bridges in Osaka. You would wonder whether they've also seen the airports right across the country. You would wonder whether they've seen the road infrastructure. You know, the indoctrination is so bad that the MPs think that, uh, you know, CDF is everything. Yes, CDF has done some work in our constituencies, but we want to remind the people that uh, even when CDF was at 1.6, there's so much development that happened. Now, what is happening now in the constituencies that are, uh, are situated in areas where the opposition is strong, there is no development coming from central government. So there's a selective uh, way in which government is beginning to churn out uh, this development. If you look at township roads, under the PF, we, we had literally signed contracts for township roads right across the country. If you ask today, the only areas that are receiving township roads are areas where UPND is strong or the UPND is strong ones. Now, we wish to condemn this. We want to say that uh, the constitution is very clear, uh, Honorable Minister of Finance. Development must be distributed equitably. <coughs> so the selective manner with which you are churning out development, and specifically on township roads, uh, should stop. You must ensure that in the 2025 budget, you also provide for other areas which are not ordinarily your strongholds. President Edgar Chagwalungu, uh, I think, showed magnanimity when it came to development. He actually sent most of the development in uh, uh, UPND strongholds, opposition strongholds. It did not matter whether these are the areas where he didn't receive votes. Uh, otherwise, you, you, you would not have seen the Chingola Solozi Road for what it is today. Uh, you know, Kazungula, Kazungula, Kazungula Bridge is in Southern Province. That was a non-PF stronghold. The Mongu Kalabo Road is in Western Province, that is a, a non-PF stronghold. The Bottom Road is in Southern Province. The Tanpak Mazabuka Road is in Southern Province. President Edgar Chagalungu was magnanimous. He took development even to those areas because he stood as a president of Zambia, not president for PF. You, may, you, should, you, you could also be interested to that when we started the program of uh, township roads, the first township roads were done actually in Monze. That's how a, a, a leader should be. Monza and Livingstone received the first township roads. What we are seeing now, Honorable Musokotwani, is that uh, you've tactfully chosen certain areas under your stronghold where you're beginning to do township roads and other uh, developments under central government. We want you in the 2025 budget to come and uh, be able to distribute a uh, development equitably. The Mporokoso Kawamba Road, the contract on Mporokoso Kawamba Road, was terminated together with the Monze Niko Road, Solwezi Minilunga Road, and Livingston Sesheke Road, Nsama Kaputa Road, when the UPND government came into power. I can tell you that uh, the Monze Niko Road, which under the PF was contracted uh, at, a, at a cost of 370 million kwacha uh, and terminated by the UPND government, was later reawarded at the cost of 940 million kwacha. So two things happened. Firstly, they used to say that roads were more expensive under the PF. This contract was uh, uh, acquired at three times uh, the cost. But uh, most importantly, the other roads like the Sorgoso Kawamba Road, the contractor, the contract still remains terminated. Minister of Finance, in this year's budget, can you also focus on roads like Mporokoso Kawamba Road, uh, which was terminated a couple of years ago? Mongo Niko, uh, Monze Niko Road. The, this road, Monze Niko, is as important to the people of Monze as Mporokoso Kawamba Road is to the people of Mporokoso and Kawamba. Uh, by the same token, the Nsama Kaputa Road is as important to the people of Mporokoso and Nsama Kaputa as the Monze Niko Road and the Munilunga Road is to the people residing in those areas. The Sesheke Road uh, has also been worked on. We are condemning the selective manner in which you are, you, are, you, are, you are doing this development. 
and for, for your own information, something that everybody knows. Her owner, the vice president, comes from Kaputa. So, it clearly, uh, we expected that uh, a, a road like the Nsama Kaputa Road should have been priority. Because the number two in this land actually comes from that area. So there should be some agency, uh, you know, there should be some bias towards some of these roads. Because that's where our owner, the vice president, comes from. Our owner, the vice president, would be expected to go to Kaputa, to go and garner votes for the UPND uh, in not uh, too distant the future. When the elections come, how honor the vice president go to, to Northern Province? So, first of all, even the MPs from Northern Province, if the road where the VIP comes from is not done, where is the hope for, 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 the, for the rest of the roads? So, Comrade Musokotwane, these are things that um, you know you should have ordinarily remembered on your own, but we think that it's important that we remind you. Uh, I just thought I could uh, you know talk about talk about that. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Mwila. We hope that uh, the, the, the Minister of Finance will take this uh, guidance and uh, be able to change these figures so that development is spread countrywide. And there should be these roads that were terminated together with the Monza Nico Road, must, the contrast must be reinstated. Because the people of Northern Province, what is happening? The main road into Northern Province, the Mpika Kasama Road, is damaged, it's completely gone. So we have no good road to get into Northern Province. Uh, we want, with the same agency that the Monza Nico Road was uh, uh, done at three times the price, there should be agency for the Bika Kasama Road. That is the main road into Northern Province. So we expect Minister of Finance to come and, you know, and provide figures for this uh, key infrastructure in, in this other part of the country. I think. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Honorable uh, for, for, for that representation and there was input into the expectations. Um, one of the moment we touched on uh, many things, I just want to further comment um, on two of them. Uh, the issue of support to the agricultural sector. As, as we all know now, it's common language that uh, the food prices, especially our staple of food, base and minimum, are beyond the reach of the Zambians. Now, the excuse of saying it's because of the drought, that is why we are in this, is not entirely true. We have always argued that the drought just came to compound the disaster that this government had already imposed in the agricultural sector. We know that our food basket as a country is filled by the small-scale farmers. And those small-scale farmers benefit from the physical. But we saw already even before the drought how the inputs were meagerly distributed to the uh, small-scale farmers, sharing fertilizer in Medaz, you know, counting the palms of fingers and giving as, as support, as input into the agricultural sector. That contributed to the low harvest across the country. And coupled with the drought, it's basically a disaster that we have seen. So this budget has an expectation. We expect a huge allocation not to cancel FISIP, but in, in fact to increase the allocation so that our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, the small scale farmers who feed this country have access to more than just a medal of fertilizer, to make seeds so that we can increase our yield. It will take time to build our food reserves again that have been depleted mainly by the export of the maize that were stored by FRI. We do not expect that just this farming season, even if we are drained, we are going to restore the, the food basket. But with support from the farmers, not this we have seen in the past three years, we expect a big allocation in the budget to support our small-scale farmers. Secondly, I want to comment about uh, the mining sector. And uh, this message to the Honorable Minister of Finance as he comes tomorrow, he should not be the loudspeaker talking about Mupani, that, that the, the issue of Mupani has been sorted out. I'm coming from Mufrida, which is uh, where Mupani is based, uh, Mufrida and Kitwe, but I can tell the minister that that language of saying Mupani has been sorted out should not enter the chamber tomorrow, because the issues at Mupani are far from being sorted out. We've been told that the IRH, that investor from the United Arab Emirates invested $1.1 billion into Mupan. I'm here to say that that is far from the truth. 
where 1.1 billion is injected in a company, we cannot see the suffering and the complaints that those related and associated to Mopani are going through. As we speak today, suppliers still remain unpaid. Where is the 1.1 billion that this government keeps talking about that the investor has injected? Suppliers have gone for more than 50 days, 60 days without being paid. Right at Mopan, today, those that are finding opportunities to work under the contractors contracted by Mopan because we are told that the new investors injected capital financing and working capital into the mine. Today, those people that are having very few chances to work there are going home at the end of the month with 1,500 quarter. People had so much hopes that now the investors come. 1.1 billion has invested, been invested in Mopan. How does someone spend their whole month from 06 and you know the working hours in the mines are very crazy. You enter the mine at 06, you leave at 18 hours. You enter at 17 hours, you leave at 6 hours the following day. Literally, you are detached from your family, you are detached from the rest of what is happening in the community. And at the end of the month, you go home with 1,500 quarts. That's a shame. That's what I'm saying. The issues at Mopan are far from being sorted out. Even the miners that are directly employed at Mopan are not being paid their dues every month according to the work they put in. Every month in the last two months, allowances such as overtime remain unpaid. Management has to literally start explaining why the miners at the end of the month are getting paid less than what they have worked for. If the 1.1 billion has been put into that Mopan, all these challenges even the miners are experiencing should be a thing of the past. So, Honorable Minister, tomorrow find another terminology rather than saying we have sorted out the issue at Mopan because you are now a laughing stock. I'm just being honest to tell you, miners at Mopani have resigned to accept the fact that they've been shortchanged. For three years they were waiting to find this, to see this investor come. Now that the investor is on site, things have not improved. The expectations have been dampened. So, sir, as you come tomorrow, be moderate on how you praise whatever has happened in the, in the mining sector. Because even the national coffers have not even improved despite all the incentives that you have given to the mines. So, if there was any dignity remaining in the midst of finance, he must be moderate when he talks about the mining sector tomorrow. Because the country remains uh, short-changed. We have seen, you know, gold lying around, people just doing mostly of mining and whatever. The country has simply lost it in terms of harnessing the revenues that we expect to see from the mining sector. So the speech tomorrow must comfort the miners that more still yet to be done. Not that we have resolved the issues surrounding Bani, the issues surrounding KCS. Let's be honest with each other and tell the people the truth. Uh, we are moving on. Um, uh, our next speaker uh, is Honorable uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Sali. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mandareta. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is on the issue of uh, credibility. My call is that uh, the Minister of Finance should present a credible budget tomorrow. Why am I saying so? Last year, when the Minister of Finance came to Parliament, he made an announcement while he was reading his speech, the, um, the budget speech, that in the year 2024, the government will construct an airport or build an airport in Chinsai. I would like to let the minister know today, which is a day before he presents the 2025 budget, that that commitment you made in the House of the People has not been fulfilled as we speak today. In Chinsali, there is no works that are being done as regards the construction of the airport. So, um, my call or my appeal to the minister is that uh, when you are preparing your budget, please make sure that you put in the budget things that you are going to fulfill. Don't talk about things that you know that are not going to be implemented as in the case of the Chinsali Airport, which 
up to today, today is uh, 26th uh, September, which is nine months from the beginning of this year. Past the uh, almost yeah, nine months, nothing has been done. Then, number two, my expectation in uh, this uh, budget speech that the minister is going to present to the house tomorrow is that um, uh, he should make pronouncements that will speak to the fact that uh, the expenditure should move away from uh, consumption to uh, uh, investments that are going to give us uh, long lasting uh, benefits. An example that I would like to cite here is this expense that has been introduced in this year's budget, which is a uh, cash for work. I am calling uh, upon the minister that uh, the, uh, the allocation to the cash for work programs has to be removed or has to be reduced. Why am I calling for removal of cash for work expense or allocation? It is because Number one, in nature, that expense is consumption or consumptive. Or consumptive. Basically, just for consumption purposes. When you spend money on someone to remove garbage in the drainage, it's not, it's not going to give you back anything. Of course, there's clean, uh, cleanliness, the place will become clean, but uh, it's like the money has just been spent and it has to. The, next, the following day when the drainage is dirty, you have to pay again to start cleaning. Number two, this expenditure is demeaning to our people. It is better to create employment that people will be going to every day and uh, um, show to everyone that they are, they are working rather than asking people that all. Oh, Come and remove this garbage here. We will give you money so that you buy food. It is like we are not respecting that uh, people can do meaningful, meaningful jobs. When you talk about employment creation, we should take a leaf from what happened, uh, for example, the time when we were constructing Kazumbula Bridge. When that project was being implemented, we had a lot of people going for work every day to work and uh, the bridge that has been constructed there, it is bringing a lot of benefits to the people of Zambia and the, and the local people there. The, another example is like the construction of Ndola Geo Carriageway. That is a good project which has created employment, at least reasonable or meaningful employment. Cash for work is not providing uh, such kind of employment to our people. So we really need to look at this issue of uh, putting up uh, a huge allocation towards consumptive expenditure. The other reason why I'm saying this cash for work needs to be removed or the allocation for cash for work should be reduced or removed is because using the enhanced CDF, most councils, almost all the councils, over 100 councils or 116 councils, they have bought earth moving equipment and the equipment that can be used for the job that we are calling people to come and do cash for work. So what does this do? When we have equipment at the council that can be used to clean the drainages and do other small, small works, then we again start calling people to come and do those same works we are paying them money. That is a duplication of expenditure. It will render the money that we spent on the purchase of uh, these uh, equipments as waste expenditure, and it is not supposed to work like that. My other expectation in tomorrow's budget is that uh, the minister should invest, should provide an allocation for meaningful investment in other alternative sources of energy. Of course, the government has been talking so much about investment in other energy sources, but when you look at what is actually happening, there is more talking that is happening than what is actually obtaining in terms of actions. So what I'm appealing the minister to do is to ensure that these pronouncements that are being made as regards investment in alternative sources of energy should be backed by a meaningful 
budget allocation. Because you can talk about investing in other energy sources, but if you are not doing anything, then you have to know that the, uh, ob the objective that you have set is not going to achieve any meaningful, uh, meaningful results. Because uh, I think by now we all know that uh, solar energy that we have been talking about, it is also not very reliable. In fact, I should just say that it is not reliable. So the government has to start investing or has to start planning the investing in hydrogen energy and other energy energy sources. This issue of energy has uh, affected our people negatively. And as a result, I do expect that uh, the minister in tomorrow's uh, budget speech, he should talk about meaningful incentives and relief that should be extended to local businesses. And uh, I expect that uh, the allocation for dismantling of local areas for local businessmen should also be increased because, look, most of the local businessmen that we have, they are owed by the government. And the money that they are owed has not been paid for a long time. Every year we hear now we are increasing the allocation for dismantling of local areas, domestic areas, but you find that uh, the domestic areas do not finish. Now we have this energy crisis which has made the cost of doing business high and most of the business are closing down. So to help our local businesses, let us give them tax incentives. Then in addition to that, let us also help them with paying them what we owe them as uh, as, as, uh, as government. Uh, the last point that I want to talk about is the issue that Honorable Mundubile talked about where he said the Minister of Finance needs to sit with the Minister of Agriculture so that uh, they talk about how they can support the agricultural sector. Of course there will be money that will be allocated to the agricultural sector to support agricultural programs. Now, if these agricultural programs are not properly implemented, then we will not head anywhere. At the moment, we are struggling with uh, finding maize because the maize that we had were sold by this government uh, and uh, in the ministry under the leadership of Honorable Mdolo. Yeah. Now, while we have that challenge, which has also resulted in minimum being short on the market, the Ministry of Agriculture has gone ahead with the idea of implementing an e-voucher program in most districts, which include the constituents where I come from. Now, this e-voucher system has been tried in the past and it didn't work very well. That's the reason why it was kind of put on hold by the previous government. Now, my issue is that uh, we are just coming from a drought and we, have, we don't have sufficient, sufficient mess on the market, we don't have sufficient minimum on the market, we cannot come up with a policy that we are going to, to be trying again. This will take the, uh, it, it will make us fail to achieve what it is that we want. What we want is to ensure that in the 2024-2025 farming season, there should be sufficient yields from the farmers such that we should have sufficient reserves that can take us at least for a year, two or three. Now, the introduction of e-voucher will not help us to achieve that. With this few remarks, uh, Mr. Moderator, I end here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honor uh, Pompasa, for your input and submission on the expectation um, of tomorrow's budget for 2025. If you have just joined us uh, via various platforms, I want to welcome you to this press briefing being held today by members of the Patriotic Front, members of the Parliament, and we are sharing our views and expectations on their views and views on tomorrow's budget presentation and we are here tomorrow Friday, the 27th of September, the Minister of Finance is expected to come to Parliament and present this UPND government's fourth budget for 2025. So we are here to lay clear our expectations 
Honorable uh, Professor has been speaking, and he touched on so many things. I just want briefly to, to, to add on, uh, on the areas that he has touched. I think he spoke about uh, us expecting solutions to sort out this energy crisis. And he has put it very clear about the so much talked about you know, uh, solar as an alternative source of energy. The Minister of Finance and his counterpart in the Minister of Energy, as they come tomorrow to talk about 2020 budgets, we need to put it very clear to them that when you are, when you, when, when you are encouraging, you know, especially the, the, the domestic uh, users, uh, our customers of this way, to go solar, you must also understand that people don't just want power for lighting. And in these communities, there is a lot more that people use power. People, some families even survive, survive through baking, scones, cakes, and all those things. So, how much should they put up in terms of the solar to power their, their microbes and to, to power their um, cook stoves? Because solar now is just for lighting. But people can survive even without lighting. They can use candles and everything else. So, how much money are you empowering the communities? Very few people can afford even the solar. The, more, the modest solar package now, someone has to do for 15,000 bucks in the communities. Go to Kanyama, go to Chimwemwe, go to Rwanda, you know, go to Kasama, go to Mongo. How many people have got 15,000 or 20,000 to spare just to put up their solar package at their home only for lighting? People need to move their motors because there are welders in these communities. There are people with the backup shops. There are people with saloons. Are those motors and engines going to run from solar? So let's be realistic. We should not encourage people to go and borrow and invest in something that is not going to sort out their problem. So we expect the government to allocate sufficient money. If it means importing power, let's import so that we have enough through this scope so that those who survive in baking scones can switch on their stoves and bake and provide food on the table, can run their welding machines, can run their, their bagging machines. Not just talk about go solar, go solar. Only for that, we must be careful, you know, with that. And the other thing that I talked about is uh, looking, taking care of the domestic debt that the local suppliers and the government are owed. For, my, for me, this budget I expect it to be expansionary. We expected the economy to grow by by by, by 4.8% this year, but that has been downgraded. We are now expecting, not that we are even achieved, we are now looking at 2.2. Basically, our economy is shrinking. So this budget must be expansionary. And when you want to run an expansionary budget, you must increase expenditure. So let's empower our citizens to spend. How do we do that? Release the money that is owed to the local suppliers and the domestic debt must be dismantled. So enough allocation must go to the dismantling of domestic debt so that we have enough money circulating in the economy. So people have got disposable income when we dismantle that debt. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, our next speaker now is the main speaker of the our program for today. And now I invite Ronald from the Kapoya. Uh, to share with us uh, our position as patriotic as far as we expect to see uh, in here in the budget that we presented today. Honorable and now invited. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, my brother and colleague, Honorable Moila, for calling upon me to address the media. Uh, allow me to begin by recognizing all the honorable members who are here and as I do recognize all the members of the media fraternity who have joined us today. Gentlemen uh, and women, I think today is a good day to, uh, to, to address ourselves to the thoughts we have about uh, President Akainde Chilema's budget, uh, which is going to be a great one of them to bring to the House for consideration and possible approval. Uh, and as my colleagues were speaking, I listened keenly uh, 
Honorable Mungudire said uh, there's been excuses, a lot of excuses. You know, at one point we were told to wait for our budget, their budget came, uh, they, we had to be diverted again. We were told now wait for the IMF deal. At some point that was achieved uh, and what we were waiting for could not materialize. So we were diverted again. We were told wait for debt restructuring. Today we are being told a debt has been successfully restructured. Maybe the question is what else are we going to wait for? Um, I want to recommend to the European government that they should not start saying wait for the end of the climate change uh, because climate change is not going to end. Now, I will not address uh, the Honourable Minister, Honourable Senator. I will address the President because that budget belongs to the President. Uh, Honourable Senator is just a tool for presentation and defense uh, in order for the budget to be approved. Mr. President, the Zambian people are hungry. They are hungry because the cost of living is very high. The Zambian people are also hungry and they are angry because your governance is poor. Your governance has been poor because of many issues, including your failure to fulfill your campaign promises. Now, in this budget, you have an opportunity to be able to redeem yourself. In this budget, I want to recommend very strongly that you focus on the plight of the majority poor citizens of this country, as opposed to focusing on the plight of IMF and foreign investors. I strongly recommend that the young people, the majority young people who supported you during the 2021 general elections, who hoped that you would create employment for them, who hoped that you would create business opportunities for them, economic opportunities for them, can be able to see hope in this budget. Uh, that you are sending your council and the president of your behalf. I am calling upon you to ensure that Dr. Musakwani does not go to the National Assembly to talk about recruitment of teachers and health workers. Those young people who supported you are not all trained as teachers or trained in paramedics or anything to do with medical uh, issues. There are several young people who are trained elsewhere and you need to create employment for them. Mr. President, I want to remind you that the Zambian people are not yet buying millennium at 25 points. This was your promise. Oh, sorry, at 50 points, per 25 kg buy. This was your promise. I want to remind you that the Zambian people are not yet buying a liter of petrol at 12 quart, or is it 13 quart? This was your promise. I want to remind you that the Zambian farmers are not yet buying a, bar, a 50 kg bag of fertilizer at 250 quart. This was your promise. And I want to remind you that there is too much corruption in your government. What is even worse is that the corruption involving your ministers, you are deliberately hiding their identity from the Zambian people. You don't want the Zambian people to know which among your ministers are corrupt 
which ones are being investigated. Therefore, you are not transparent. Your government has failed on the score of transparency. Your government has failed on the score of accountability. As a matter of fact, the fact that your government was able to institute to bring Africa in this country without the approval of the Zambian people, even through the National Assembly of Zambia, shows that you have refused to be accountable. There are many issues that we have raised. Mr. President, democracy in our country has been damaged. As we stand now, it's as if there's no democracy. Because look at what your government has allowed to happen to the Patriotic Front Party, even through the Registrar of Societies, which is 100% under control. Look at what is happening in the judiciary now. Your Excellency, Mr. President, there is no rule of law in Zambia. If there was rule of law in Zambia, Excellency, Ron Mwamba would not be sitting as Dr. General today as I speak. He would not be in that office doing the work that he is doing. There are no human rights anymore. This is why some people can be allowed to have meetings, others cannot. It's because now it is the rule of man uh, which is prevailing. Now, given all these difficulties that we have, I want to recommend specific measures that may cause the Zambian people to look at you differently. I want you, Mr. President, to ensure that the budget that you delegate Dr. Msokotwani to bring to the Assembly has no provision for borrowing. Why shouldn't this budget have no provision for borrowing? Number one, you promised moratorium mandate. You are the one who told this nation that this country has no capacity to borrow. Your minister, the one you are sending tomorrow, reiterated your call for moratorium mandate. Now, if you find it impossible to bring a budget which has no fiscal deficit, I encourage you not to borrow from domestic resources. Because if you do, you are going to deplete the little money that is available for private investment. You crowd, you crowd out domestic investment. So clearly, I expect no fiscal deficit. And if there is going to be, you break your promise further uh, by borrowing again, I would encourage you to consider borrowing your money. Don't borrow what is local and present. Let the suffering private investor players have a chance to find liquidity on the market and be able to borrow to invest. Because these are the only players who can create employment, even for those young people who supported you, for whom you have failed to create employment. Mr. President, I want to recommend that your budget tomorrow must have an allocation for subsidies related to Mirimil. I recommend that you subsidize Mirimil because Mirimil at 350 kwacha is out of reach for most poor Zambians. Now this is a short-term measure. Let Zambians be able to eat in Shima. The only way you are going to have poor Zambians eat in Shima is by you subsidizing minimum. After that, all the investments that my colleagues talked about in farming blocks in the agricultural sector should be able to help us in the long or in the medium and long term. But immediately subsidize minimum. Reduce the price of minimum. I know your promise was 50 quarter to 25 kg back. But you may not reach that target 
bring it to at least 100 kwacha. At least 100 kwacha. You found it at 115, 116, 120. You bring it down to at least 100 kwacha. Then the Zambian people may be happy uh, with you. I want to strongly recommend that, uh, Mr. President, your budget should contain a substantial allocation towards the subsidies for farmers' input support. Fertilize and seed. Subsidize. If you subsidize fertilize and seed, there is a chance that the cost of fertilizer may even come down to what you, uh, what you are condemning 600 quarter per bag. It's unsustainable for poor farmers. It's, uh, it's out of reach for poor farmers to be buying a, a 50 kg bag of fertilizer at uh, over 1,000 quarter. I want to passionately and strongly recommend that you make an allocation for the importation of electricity. In this budget, allocate for the importation of electricity. Sufficient electricity to be able to light up our industry, to be able to light up our homes and our streets, to make them safe and to ensure that the industry can be able to produce and uh, we, uh, our homes can be able to do all, all sorts of things. As my friend was saying, some of your people, some of these poor people are surviving on baking. I think I need not to talk about uh, uh, the trading in meat products uh, because I hear the president has a lot of animals, uh, a number of which are slaughtered for, uh, and headed for butcheries. You know that a butchery cannot survive without electricity. But it's not just rich people like you, Mr. President, who trade in meat. There are small butcheries for poor people. Support them, import electricity, distribute this power to them so that they are able uh, to survive. Mr. President, I would like to recommend that you increase taxation for the mines. I'm sure the three years that you have been in office, you might have noted by now that concessions that you offered are not working. If they were working, Zambia would have been better off by now. Increase the amount of revenue that you collect from the mining sector by increasing mineral oil tax. And if I were to add, I would recommend that you make mineral oil tax non-deductible for tax purposes. Then you go back to what it used to be, where you were collecting revenue, you know, where the dollar to watch a rate was hovering around 15 quarter, up and down, around 15 quarter. Because you have no foreign exchange coming into the country on account of these very poor concessions, you now have a problem. The, the, this rate now is over in 26 quarter up and down. It's a very poor rate. Remember, you promised the appreciation of the quarter, uh, I think, four hours after being sworn in. This is now over three years since you were sworn in. The quarter has not appreciated. Instead, it has depreciated. Mr. President, if indeed the targets on Lusaka to Dollar Road are going to be given away, if it is true that borders like the one in Kasumbalesa uh, um, and, uh, and the other border here in Southern Province, Chihundu, are going to be given away. I want to tell you that your treasury is going to lose revenue. Therefore, this budget must provide for alternative revenue to plug the gap that is going to be 
uh, sunk by these very poor decisions. I want you to show us that the revenue that government will forego by these decisions is going to be plugged by these initiatives. Otherwise, without debt, without revenue from these targets, revenue from these uh, border posts, and uh, all these other uh, uh, very, very unfortunate decisions, you will have a situation where you won't be able to support the interventions that you are putting in your budget today. So I recommend that without alternative revenue sources, do not transfer these assets to the so-called concessionaires. I also want to strongly recommend that your tax incentives, tax incentives, must go towards the supply side of the macroeconomy. The advantage of pushing tax incentives to the supply side of the macroeconomy is that they will deal with employment at the same time as they are dealing with inflation. So you will see that uh, by ignoring, for now, ignoring the, uh, or paying less attention you know, to the demand side, you'll be able to create employment and you'll be able to manage inflation. But for the workers, those who have worked and worked and worked in spite of the difficulties from COVID now into, um, into the drought and all the challenges that we have had, I want to recommend that, Mr. President, you reduce their pay as you can. Reduce they are paid as you earn. Because the tax burden on workers has been too much. Reduce their pay as you earn while you provide for increasing their salaries. This is time that workers can also benefit, you know, from their government. Mr. President, let me conclude my appeals by demanding that you end your shedding now. And you can do so by importing electricity. The, the genesis and the solar systems cannot end your shedding because genesis operate on fuel, which fuel is very expensive. And then the solar systems are so expensive such that your people, your young people voted for you, the, the, the many mothers and the fathers in our, in our shanty compounds and in our high density areas cannot afford. So even as you bring these alternatives, you must look at the plight of the poor uh, because in fact the poor are the majority. Your excellence to reduce the cost of living now. Because as we speak about this 2025 budget, the people need to eat now. They need to survive now. Reduce the cost of labor. Your Excellency, Mr. President, I want you to end corruption now. Don't say that uh, we have a new policy. Your policy, as I said elsewhere, is not working. Because you have a new policy, you are hiding ministers who are being investigated. That's why I say that's a poor policy. It's not working for the people. It's not working to enhance the reputation you would like to have of being accountable and of being transparent. Mr. President, end regionalism, bad governance, tribalism. All these things, you need to end them now end maladministration, end bad governance, ensure that all the bad decisions you have made in the past, even of lumping more than 600 people at the voting position, some of them not being deployed for a period of over two and a half years, all those things must come to an end.
and you have the power to end all these matters and make the lives of the Zambian people better. My call for you is make the lives of the Zambian people better. Yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Honor, for the choir, uh, for, for, your, for the delivery on there for the party of what we expect to hear tomorrow in the 2025 budget. I must, I must add that I know the Minister of Finance likes jargon, economic jargon, and uh, one of the jargons that we are going to hear tomorrow is is uh, is emphasis on fiscal consolidation. We are going to hear him talk about fiscal consolidation so much, but I want to remind the minister that when you talk about fiscal consolidation, it has two legs: it has expenditure and revenue. So don't just talk about fiscal consolidation by reducing government expenditure, not going to grow the economy. Focus on the revenue side of fiscal consolidation. And that's why you get what I'm talking about. Talk about maximizing our revenue from the mining sector. That is where the revenue for the government lies. We should not overtax the workers, either directly or indirectly. Let's go for the mines and get the maximum revenue. In that way, you are going to achieve your fiscal consolidation. Do not just curtail on the expenditure that you want to contain government expenses. Raise the revenue. And raising the revenue, go to the mines. That is our, our, our revenue earner for the government. So far in the last three years, we have lost a lot through those incentives that we have given. And if we continue on that trajectory, there will be less and less money in the economy sending, this, uh, sending the citizens into further poverty. Second last, I also want to talk about uh, reduce, like I said, on, on your jargon and your know terminology. Zambians are not interested in the GDP growth rate. Zambians are not interested in how much inflation you want to contain by giving percentages. By the way, all the targets that were set to be achieved in the 2024 budget have been missed. The growth rate has been missed. Containing inflation has been missed. Interest rates have been missed. Everything has gone in the opposite direction. So please, it's a reminder. And I can quote what uh, you know, our former finance minister may so rest in peace on Alexander Chuan. Don't just bask in the empty glory of statistical euphoria. <laughs> Be a transformation government that will offer solutions tomorrow. Zambians want to hear how load shedding, water shortage, employment, food is going to be made available through your budget tomorrow. And fuel the cost of fuel. But those are simple terms. Rather than you using the jargon that will end up delivering nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we come to the end uh, of, of our press address. I will invite questions if you have questions for the panel. And as you have seen, our panel is very full. We have got members of parliament, honorable member from Konde, honorable member from Labush Manda, honorable member from Pika, Mansahombe, they are here. So if you have questions to ask, this is the opportunity. Are there any questions that we can take? Well, the members are still available as we leave this room. If you want the one on one engagement with them, they are welcome. I want to thank the honorable members that found time to come for this address and let us all leave uh, this place and wait to, to hear what the government who the rest of us will be talking about in the budget. Thank you very much.